Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Chessable Masters. It's the fourth tournament in the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour in the 2022 season. And yes, unfortunately for all of you, I am once again wearing a tank top. You see, I ordered about 10 of these things now that it's like 90 degrees in New York, not Celsius, Fahrenheit. We use this silly system here. Um, so I'm going to be wearing a tank top and we're going to be looking at a lot of different games today as the players try to qualify for the playoffs. If you don't remember how this works, there are 16 players in the preliminary stage, which means they play 15 rounds, which means the top eight qualify. Um, and as always, Magnus Carlsen uh, treats these games and these, these matches and these online events as sort of a way to experiment with just every different array of openings possible, including the move H4. Yeah. You're looking at this right. The GOAT, regarded by many, uh, is, uh, is playing the move H4 against Wei Yi. Wei Yi being one of the strongest players uh, in the world, in China as well. Um, I guess I should say in China and also in the world as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, he just plays D5. He's kind of like, what the hell are you doing? Like, what is H4? I mean, H4 is not, you know, just because you see him doing it, uh, don't do it yourselves. Um, again, uh, if, if, if black doesn't, uh, H4 is like, it's not a horrible move. I mean, black is not like, it's not even minus one. It's like minus 0.6. Uh, and if you actually end up casting long, there's ways you can use this pawn, you know, but, uh, yeah, I mean, H4 is absurd. And the game actually becomes a queen's gambit declined. So it's like a queen's gambit declined, right? It's like way he is playing white D4, D5, C4, right? But for some reason, you have an extra move, h4, or h5. Um, so Magnus plays a Tarash defense, mirror image. So what I'm, what I'm basically saying is, this is the opening, all right? This is what you're seeing, except for some reason, there's h5 on the board as well, right? That, that's basically what you're seeing. I mean, it, it, it's a complete mirror image of one another, except there's the move h5, or h4. Um, yeah, way ye in this game basically did nothing about the move h4. I mean, he just sort of left it there. Uh, Magnus took on c5 and played b4, expanding on the queen side, and developed his, his dark squared bishop. And now the move h4 is actually going to start looking genius, because, for example, let's say Wei Yi castles, there's going to be positions where you can play h5, and then you could even play h6, and all of a sudden, Magnus Carlsen is just, I mean, is just, you making him look like Albert Einstein, all right? You're making him look not like a chess grandmaster, but like he invented some civilization-changing thing. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's crazy. It, like, again, in chess, oftentimes, if we make our opponents look smart, they, they turn out smarter than uh, they really are. In Magnus's case, he's already kind of smart. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, your opponents, maybe not so much, but don't let people get away with stuff. Well, Wei Yi decides, all right, I'm going to take on C4. Uh, and uh, this sends us to basically a Queen's Gambit accepted endgame. What I mean by that is both sides have lost their D and C pawns, but again, Magnus still has H4. And at some point, Magnus might do something with that king side. He might play H5, he might play G4, because his bishops are really nice. They're actually doing a very decent job on that side of the board. Uh, castles, knight D2. And uh, yeah, I mean, Magnus brings the H rook over. You ask why he brings the H rook. This rook might want to help with the A pawn, uh, or just go to the B file. Uh, could, could Magnus have played Rook AC1? Yeah, but he, he might have been worried about some A5 stuff. Maybe not right away, but that being the general idea. And maybe even straight up right away, because Bishop B5, there's this, and then you take. So maybe Magnus just wanted more support. And as you see throughout this game, he just sort of very comfortably expands his position. He damages Wei Yi's pawn structure, right? And then he does play G4, and he does play H5. So, it's plus 0.8. I mean, it's plus 0.8. Only Magnus can do this. I feel like if I tried to play H4 against Wei Yi, he'd punch me in the face. Like, even if we were playing a game on the internet, he would find a way to punch me in the face. He would... I don't know. I don't know how that would work, but I feel like Wei Yi would find a way. Uh, well, you know, Magnus is doing Magnus things. He's just... He's, he's expanding very slowly. He has uh, an end game where he's just got a very comfortable advantage. Uh, Wei Yi cannot take on G4 because there's a hanging bishop, right? That's why knight f3 hits the knight and the bishop. Uh, bishop e7, and we have takes, takes, and rook c1. Magnus here, and actually a little bit later, had an idea to play king f3, king e4. He does that. First, he activates his rook. And this is the best position that he has in the entire game. Maybe, uh, maybe, like, yeah, I mean, he's expanded his position to the absolute maximum. Absolutely all his pieces are useful. 
Knight c5 is coming. Maybe a rook c5 to get some pawns. King takes e5. And Wei Yi times right now as the moment that he has to create counterplay. Which is why I think a couple of moves ago, it was even better for Magnus to play King f3. That's not King f3. Because if Wei Yi had gone for the same approach, uh, there is no bishop d8. So there is no way for Wei Yi to actually play the move e5. Um, sorry, a5. Just e5. What am I saying? Uh, but, you know, maybe he would have played rook c7, rook c3. So it's kind of like pick your poison, right? And Magnus does get a pretty decent position. Wei Yi, though, timely break on the queen side. Now his rook gets in. And even though Magnus is, uh, is still very active and extremely well coordinated and definitely has the better position, uh, Wei Yi is still defending. The game is not over. Uh, we have f4 check. Wei Yi has walked his king to g4 to take a pawn. Takes bishop back, rook b7. All right, look at that move. That is a savage move. If you take the bishop, look at this. This is mate in the middle of the board. What? Wei Yi, clutch defending. Now he's losing, it's plus 0.3. So h4 is paying off. Magnus is up three pawns. But I think here he had to keep his b pawn. And then he had to take. What Magnus did incorrectly is he took and he got into an endgame where accidentally he's not winning as cleanly as he maybe was prior, right? Wei Yi plays king h5. And now Magnus has to cut the king off on the edge of the board, and he does. All right, king h4, e7, h5, king d6, right? I mean, Magnus is going to promote, right? That's what he's doing. Rook e3, king f8, rook f7, rook g... Okay, rook f3, where's the win? Where's the win at? I mean, king g8, rook e3, where's the win? King f7 back, king f... Where's the win? He goes to g6, where's the win? Oh my goodness. Rook e1, king f6, where's the win? Where's the win? I don't know. Oh my... Okay, first of all, I think they've repeated... I feel like they've repeated moves. Um, and Magnus makes a rook. And this was not the win. This was not the win. All right, because now the age pawn goes and the black king shoulders the white king away. And, oh my goodness, and it's just, it's just a draw. Now, if we go back ever so slightly to the position where there was a million checks going on, running this through an engine is extremely uh, annoying because the computer just constantly wants to repeat moves. Um, apparently... You can try to win the game by running the king to d7, right? You're, you're not supposed to run the king this way. So check here, check. It looks like you're going to get checked all the way, right? I mean, but king e8. And now let's say black plays king h3. Okay, now rook g6. h4, right? That's exactly what black's trying to do. King f7, rook f3, check. You block. And then you block. So Magnus in a counterintuitive way, had to go in front of the, uh, like, like this. Now, if rook e3 was played there, rook g6, and then he does the same idea. Okay, so he had to move his king in front, give Wei Yi a chance to push, and then rook g6 and use the rook as a shield. He didn't see it, and couldn't get the win after playing the move h4. What are you gonna do? He still played h4 and got a completely winning position against a world-class player. It's ridiculous. Now, Rest of the games I have for you today are from people who are trying to qualify uh, for the playoffs, and Ariantari is one of them. Uh, Vidit plays h4 against uh, bishop f5, the tall variation, and Ariantari plays a move that I have never seen in my life. In this position with black, I have seen h6, h5, um, queen b6, uh, queen c7, queen c8. I have never in my life seen the move a6. I don't even begin to understand that move. Obviously, white plays g4, and we have bishop back to d7. Knight c3, e6, and I mean, Vidit just has a lot more space. And Tari plays the move c5. Now, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm understanding about the move a6 is that it covers the b5 square, which is very important. Uh, and white has to take. Like, for example, if white just sits around, then black will play queen b6, knight c6, the, the, the queen side will be locked, and it, it's, it's not that bad of a position. So dc5 and we have the following structure right where vidit has more space here maybe we'll play bishop d3 but now black justifies the move a6 and plays the move b5 
And if you see me making random motions with my cheeks, it's because I'm uh, like puffing my face. I'm not trying to be a puffer fish. Uh, jaw problems, you know how it is. Can't have a day on this earth sometimes, you know, without something in your body being wrong. Um, Bishop d3, knight e7, long castles, and it's very clear Vidit just wants to fight. Vidit's just, he's just come to scrap. h5, queen g5, h6, get in on the dark squares. Is Tari gonna castle? <clears throat> I don't know. Is he gonna castle long or short? I don't know. But for now, he's just attacking, all right? So we see the entire justification of his position. Right, if Vidit takes on b5, a, b5, and I mean, why would you ever do this to yourself? That seems terrible. So king b1, knight f4. Uh, but listen, uh, v, you know, Vidit also can play attacking moves. Uh, he chooses to go rook c1 to, I guess, play c3. And that doesn't look so ab ab absurd. Like, if, you know, if he gets the move c3 and then rips open the c-file, he turns everything against his opponent. He does it with c4, right? That's his idea. d c4 takes... And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is like vintage opposite side attacking stuff. Position is hanging on a knife's edge, you know, g5, h5 coming, knight h5 coming. Maybe you're going to take on b5 at some point. Maybe you're going to go to d1 and try to trade rooks. I don't know. I'm just a spectator. I I'm not making the moves. So queen e4, knight d4, look at that move. Cutting the circulation of the white position, coordination and circulation, all right? Knight to g5, Vidit is going for it. That is a Greek gift quasi, quasi Greek gift. Not sacking on h7, but sacking on g5. If hg, <coughs> excuse me, there would be hg and a devastating attack. So what happens? Trojan horse, he doesn't take it. Plays g6 and suddenly white realizes he doesn't really have much of an attack and he gets desperate, right? Desperate times call for desperate measures. Let me sack both my knights. And Tari's like, nah, I'm not going to take either of your knights. But you have to take mine. Three knights are being sacrificed at the same time. Uh, you have to take this one because the queen is hanging. If you play bc, then bc and queen b2. So it's mate. So you have to sack your rook. But then it's still mate. So even though you get a check, Tari just doesn't accept your offering. I mean, the two Trojan horses. Queen back to c2. And now I do accept the offering of the knight because the queen has been kicked out. And uh, I start picking up material. And I'm just a rook up. And uh, yeah, I mean, Tari... Ends up winning the second rook as well. And a super convincing 30-move win with black in the Karo Khan. I mean, I have to go investigate this a6 move. I'm, 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 I'm going to be adding this to my toolbox. I've, I've really not seen that move ever before. And this is... Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, maybe like once in Blitz, you know? But... Um, so yeah, thank you, Ari Antari. You've taught me something today. Uh, I've, I've just never seen that move. So very, very nice game by Black. Tari uh, doing quite well. He, he did f uh, finish in the top eight. Uh, Ding Li Ren versus Pintala Hare Krishna. I mean, Ding Li Ren, you just got to include his games because this guy is the universal player uh, of... Uh, I mean, he's just good at everything. Great openings, tactics, uh, positional and strategic play, end game skills. And Hare Krishna, very strong Indian grandmaster. We have a uh, Alapin Sicilian. Uh, with a with an early pawn sacrifice So Hare Krishna is trying to have some fun He sacrifices a pawn against Ding and what he's gonna do throughout this game now is he's gonna play chess Right, he's gonna try to win the pawn back, but he's also just gonna play chess and Ding Li Ren Sacrifices a rook He did not blunder a fork Ding Li Ren is like I don't think it's worth you taking my rook so in this position, he then takes with the king, not the rook or the queen, but the king. Why would you? What? So it's move 15. Material is equal. Uh, Ding has a knight and two pawns for a rook. All right. Position is about balanced. However, rooks are more endgame pieces. You really don't feel them on the board until it's a little bit later in the game. All right. Knights and bishops, you do feel. And if you have more pawns and you move them all forward together, you do feel their presence, right? So Ding Li Ren goes for a queen trade, all right? He wants to trade off the queens. He also wants to trade off the knights. The less pieces that Hare Krishna can play with, the better it is for Ding, because he has four pieces right now, right? So, uh, you know, Rook F8 is coming, E5, E4, Knight E2, et cetera. Uh, Pentala plays Bishop E3. Now we have check here, and Ding just takes the pawn. He just grabs it. Now, 
if you play rook b1 here, there's just a fork. So bishop takes a7, played by Hare Krishna. Uh, and Dingley Ren plays a hilarious move here. He has a queen. He could take this. He can move his knight. He can move his rook. He doesn't want to do this because he doesn't want to deal with the counterattack. So instead he plays king d7. Which looks like a mouse slip. Like, that move doesn't even... But the idea of king b7, I guess, is he wants to play rook a8. And he also wants his king off any checking squares. And then he picks up the rook. And he plays rook a8. So if rook b2, there is this. And this king is always safe from the checks, right? There's e6. But the king can also just hide on the back rank. If something like this happens, uh, you could take the rook. Uh, sorry, you could take the bishop with the rook. And completely winning. So, bishop back to e3, rook a2, and I mean, the man is just up three pawns. He's just up three pawns. And this is all from a very early, just provocative exchange sacrifice. Like, seemingly completely unnecessary. Uh, and, you know, he just gets two pawns for it. Makes the right decisions to trade. And then jumps in and grabs just a pawn. Just grabs the pawn. Rook is hanging understanding the tactics of the position better than his opponent. And Ding is so good at just transforming the position to a winning endgame. I'm always impressed by how easy they make it look. Rook A1, trading into an endgame up two pawns. And um, yeah, I mean, the king defends everything. The bishop comes back, takes the bishop, check. And Hare Krishna resigns because he's going to get bounced around here, you know, with checks. One final move here, by the way. <clears throat> Not taking but checking the king into a check. All right, taking with check, it's, it's advanced. It's advanced techniques, all right? Um, and Ding wins, making it look like, like nothing. I mean, honestly, just making it look like whatever. He just, it's amazing how easy they make it look. Um, the fourth game that I have for you today is between Mamidyarov and Pragnananda. Prag is of course, uh, exceptional player. Uh, and he, he's been on a tear, like beating Magnus. Uh, I mean, Mamedyarov is a beast. He's always trying, he's, he's always kind of qualifying and, uh, and, you know, and advancing in these events. Um, so let's see if Mamedyarov can beat the kid. Uh, that's sad. That's, I, that could have that been said better. Um, so we have d4, knight f6, and with my left hand, I'm ordering food. It's incredible. I'm multitasking, right? So d4, knight f6. Uh, c4, e6, and we have this cd5, knight d5, semi tarash. This is all theory. All right, takes on d5, e4, trades knights, trades pawns, trades bishops, and now bishop c4. And black here will put the bishop here, put this knight either here, here, or there, and then connect the rooks. <clears throat> okay, the rooks actually were not connected, so this is actually important. There was no knight f6. There was no queen move, and there was no connection of the rooks. Instead of that, there was rook e8. And now, uh, Mamidyarov plays an approach to this position, which has become relatively popular. Uh, and, I, and I actually think last year in the Chessable Masters, or maybe in 2020 in the Chessable Masters, not last year, um, the, uh, I, I believe it was Magnus who played like this against the Nishgiri. I actually have a video uh, of that game. And it was d5 takes... And then not taking back, playing knight d4, sacrificing pawns to rip open the center of the board. Uh, and it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very legitimate way to play. Um, so, rook c5 by Prague. f3, defending the center. You could do a couple of different things here. Uh, in a perfect world, you get to play f4 and e5 and get this wedge. And then rotate your pieces this way and just mate. The problem is the second you play f4, there's going to be pawn takes pawn. And if you're wondering why Prog isn't just taking, uh, knight f5 is too strong for the moment. Like, you, you, don't, you don't want to deal with all this. There's too many threats. Uh, maybe you can. Maybe you can play knight c5, rook e7, be like Dingley Ren, sacrifice a rook. Unnecessary, though. Okay? Unnecessary. Uh, so, rook c5. And knight f6, e5. And I just told you, you want to avoid this wedge. You, I just told you. A player who wants to checkmate another player wants the center closed. Especially if they're on the same side, castle. If opposite side, doesn't matter. But, and from this point forward, 
This knight becomes a god, okay? Queen g4, and very impressive move here. Bishop takes d7. Removing that piece from the black position in order to play f5. All right? Now we see that even though Prague has pieces on the board, they're made of plastic. They are not made of wood. The white pieces are made of wood. Beautiful coordination here by Mami Diarov, who just locks the cage with f6. Uh, oh, I, I think that was my phone dinging. Jeez. Scary. Um, I think instead of... Some, somewhere here... Yeah, yeah I, I think f6 won immediately. Uh, with the idea to just play queen h6. So for example here, knight back to f3, and uh, you cannot prevent both threats. So rook back to c8, queen h6. So I think, I think instead of um, rook e3, f6 just won straight up. And if rook e8, queen h6. Kind of funny. Mami Jarov missed knight back to f3. Backwards knight moves can be the trickiest in chess. But he continues assaulting, right? Uh, queen f4. And here comes the second wave of the attack. And I mean, this position is just impossible to defend with black. You have a light squared bishop fighting on a dark squared board, all right? The bishop is great on e4, make no mistake, but this queen is being beat up and those pieces are stuck to the back rank. And at some point when you have such good pressure, something's gonna crack and it does, all right? Knight f7. I mean, it looks like you can't get in, but you can. When, when a player has very little space to defend themselves, there's almost always going to be a tactic, and here it is, rook e8, and Prague just can't defend himself because f7 is coming. So he ends up having to lose the queen, but it's much worse than that because, again, he has no space. So even though he can play a move like rook f8, queen e6 check, he could block. I'll take the pawn. I mean, I'm just going to take everything, and you have no way of defending yourself in the long run. So, yeah, I mean, the summary of this game can basically be this position. Look at this. Two rooks, queen knight, two pawns. This is just not a position you want to play against Mami Diarov. He's a bowling ball. He's going to roll you over. I mean, he, he just can't. It's, he's like a bowling ball on a, on a downhill slope. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, yeah. So, a great win for Mami Diarov over Prague. Uh, and uh, that takes me to my final game of today's recap, which is a Nidorf Sicilian between Wei Yi and Anish Giri. What do we know about the Knight of Sicilian? Nothing. Not me, not you, nobody knows anything about this opening. Uh, but we do know that we have castled on opposite sides. Which means someone's getting mated. Uh, which also means someone's probably getting mated in the next 15 to 20 moves. Um, no one survives opposite side castling Knight Orfs. Nobody. All right, absolutely nobody. Knight b6 by Anish. g5, rotating backwards. Both knights have left the king. They are now going to attack the enemy king. It's one of those games. Uh, knight a5, trying to block the queen side pawns from expanding. Queen c7, king b1. And what, uh, what happens here is Wei Yi plays knight d5. This is a very common square in the knight orf to try to win control over, to plug the d5 square. That kind of lays the foundation for the opening moving forward. Um, but he can also play h4 here. h4, h5, h6, g6. Tries to create something over there. He does it this way, and actually there is this move. You can take, because of this, there's that. No, if this, there's actually this. But if this, then that. And that's what happens. And now Wei Yi plays bishop d3. Again, he should be considering h4. Stockfish has been screaming for this move for like seven or eight turns. He does this, though, and threatens mate, and now plays h4. Now, if you give Wei Yi two more moves, so for example, h5, and then hg, uh, he's completely winning. Why? Like, you don't understand why he's completely winning? Because this is only protected by that, so you take that. It's that simple. A rook is not worth five points when mate is on the board. It's just, I mean, right? So, this is a very, very serious position for a niche. He must act now. So he does. Plays knight c5. Now, you don't want to lose your light squared bishop here, so bishop takes c5. And a niche here plays a move that must have really confused Wei Yi. It looks like a mouse slip. d5. What? It looks like a mouse slip. I mean, it looks like you were trying to take the bishop. But there is h5 here, and if you play c4, I can still take. It still looks very scary. Again, fg, there is still rook h7. 
You could take the bishop, but that hangs bait. Congrats. So d5 looks like a mouse slip, but the idea is to trade queens. And each wants to trade queens, equalize the position, right? Wei Yi says, no, thank you. I don't want a queen trade. And Anish says, are you sure you don't want a queen trade? A5. A4. B4. Are you really sure you don't want a queen trade? I mean, Stockfish still thinks white is better. It still thinks that Wei Yi's attack is better than Anish Yiri's attack. I mean, I told you, someone's going to lose this game, right? Someone's going to lose. Both their kings are getting stripped butt naked. I'm sorry for the visual. All right? I mean, they're both two or three moves away from being mated. This is like, th that, the game's over. It's going to end somehow. Uh, Anish plays rook takes b2 check. King to a1. h5. En passant is possible, but you would be blocking your own attack. So then f takes g6, right? So you can take en passant. If you play queen h5, your queen steps off the third rank. And you blunder rook a2, king a2, queen c4, king a3, queen c3, and queen b2. That is why the queen being on h3 is so important. It covers the c3 square. So what do you do when the move h5 happens? Apparently, you have to take on f7 and make a draw. Rook f7, g6, hitting the rook. Rook f2, queen e6, and it's a perpetual check somehow. It's not even a perpetual check. You have like rook d7. I mean... I mean, it's not even... No, most likely, the game just ends with a, with a perpetual. Yeah, it does. So check here. No, not that. Queen a2. Check here. Check. And if this... Oh, my goodness. Black has to go kick. Oh, my God. This is... This is there's no perpetual, actually. It's no perpetual check. It's just 0, 0, 0. The game, at some point, will end with perpetual check. But when the computer is saying every move is 0, 0, 0 for 10 to 15 moves, it basically means... There is a perpetual 10 moves in the future, but until then, you're stepping on... I mean, you, you're going to fall into a million traps. And way he does, he takes on Poisson. Now, FG. And here, Anish plays a move that ends the game on the spot. On the spot. Try to find it with black. Oh, wait. You're not going to guess. Trust me, you're not going to guess this move. If, if, if you guess this move and then you're in the comments like, oh my god, I can't believe I guessed the move. You're lying. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to me. Don't lie. King h8. And Wei Yu resigned. Why did he resign? Because this move is no longer a check. And that move means that rook a2 is mate. Right? Because of that whole sequence with the queen ending up on the c3 square. And if you don't play queen g6, like let's say you play h7, then black will play queen b4, and you will be mated in a few moves. It's just mate. I mean, you, 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 you just get mated. So the position after king to h8, stepping out of check, is minus 10. Black's attack worked. White's attack didn't. Insane. What a game. And the reason I ended with this game is because Anish Giri won the preliminaries. Because they have football scoring or soccer scoring, three points for a win, one point for a draw, he ended with 29 out of 45 points. First place, which means he takes on Ariantari, <clears throat> I believe, uh, in the playoffs, uh, who finished with 20, tied with David Anton. Uh, then it's Magnus Carlsen, uh, who finished in second, and he's taking on, uh, he's taking on David Anton, and Tari is taking on Giri. Wei Yi versus Prague, Ding Liren versus Mami Diarov. Playoffs start today, actually in a few hours. Uh, don't play H4, and uh, I hope your week is going to be off to a good start because I made this recap on a Monday. Peace out. I'm also going to make recaps of the Superbet Rapid and Blitz. Yeah, stay awesome. Get out of here.